All right, if everyone's ready, we will begin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Horde Steryman Magazine. Welcome to our monthly Horde Steryman webinar series. Today, our presentation is titled Capturing Full Value for Holstein and Crossbred Steers. Our presenter is Dr. Dan Schaefer, a professor emeritus in animal sciences from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. With more and more dairies incorporating beef sires into their herds, Dr. Schaefer will share his recommendations for optimizing these beef genetics and raising the kind of Holstein and crossbred steers that the, packer, the packing plants desire. Our sponsor for today's webinar is Neogen, and we certainly appreciate their support of this program. My co-host for today is Mike Hutchin, a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. Also working with us are our webinar producer, Jim Baltz, and our Horde Steerman online media manager, Patty Hurchin. If you're listening to the presentation live today, you can have, or you have access to a PDF handout of the slides that you can print off for future reference. That can be found in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. You can click on that link and print that at this time. Also, if you have any questions that come to mind during the presentation, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will answer those following the presentation. At this time, Mike, uh, would you please take a few moments to further introduce our speaker, and then we will get started with today's webinar. Well, thank you very much, Abby, and it is a distinct pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. and Professor Dan Schaefer. Uh, Dan grew up on a farm in near uh, northeast Wisconsin, near Kishwakam. You can look those up on your atlas when you get a chance, got his BS and master's degree in meat and animal sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then journeyed down to Illinois to get his PhD degree at the University of Illinois in the area of, of ruminant nutrition. From 1979 to 1980, he was a faculty member of the animal science department at Purdue University, and then in 1981, he became a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as Amy already, Abby already pointed out. His research interests includes uh, pr nutrition programs for finishing uh, uh, dairy steers, which he'll be talking about here. He was elected as chairman of the Department of Animal Sciences in 1999, and then in, except for six months, 16 months, when he was an interim associate dean for undergraduate programs at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he was the director of a meat science and animal biology, uh, biologics discovery program in 2018 and 19, resulting in a new $57 million state-of-the-art meets science lab on the campus of the University of Wisconsin. After 40 years as a faculty member, he is now an emeritus professor and has been inducted as a fellow in the Animal Science of uh, the American Society of Animal Sciences. So, Dr. Shaver, we are so pleased to have you here with today, and the program is yours. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction. I wish to express my appreciation to Horde's Dairyman for this invitation to speak on capturing full value for Holstein and crossbred steers. Uh, I'd like to begin with a poll question. Uh, if the audience could respond to this poll question, that will help me characterize our audience. Well, very good, Dan. Our first poll question, uh, please indicate your familiarity with the following topics. P-T-A-S-C-C, -C, waiting period milk fever. And we have uh, five choices. You can select one of these. One, very familiar. Two, unfamiliar. A working knowledge. Fourth, familiar. And finally, very familiar. I guess the first one I misspoke says very unfamiliar. So we go from uh, not knowing beans or buckshots all the way down that, man, I know all about this stuff. So uh, Abby, how are you going to vote on this one? Uh, wh what's your vote? Sure. So I think a lot of these these words have to deal with dairy cattle, and I think we usually have a pretty dairy-heavy audience, so I think most of our audience has at least some familiarity in this area, but we will find out very shortly. Well, Jim, let's go ahead and close the polls. We got over 70%, so we got a bunch of uh, voters here. And so, uh, Dr. Shaver, you can comment on unfamiliar, very unfamiliar, 4%. Uh, unfamiliar, 14%. Uh, working knowledge, 20%. Familiar, 32%. And uh, Abby's favorite, very familiar, 30%. What's your uh, evaluation of that? Well, this is uh, probably as expected. Uh, as I expected, I appreciate those who have joined uh, to listen to this program who have a strong dairy knowledge background. 
Uh, my role today is to really um, take you in a slightly different direction, another uh, natural outflow from the U.S. dairy production system, or for that matter, <clears throat> the global dairy production system. My outline for today is to speak on beef production from Holstein steers. Uh, Holstein steers have been a natural outflow as a byproduct or co-product of uh, milk production. So we know quite a bit about management principles, nutrition principles, and something about the carcass and, uh, and carcass quality. I'll speak about attributes and limitations <clears throat> of this beef production system and then turn that knowledge towards the implementation of beef on dairy, speaking about challenges and, uh, and some of my views for how the beef knowledge of that exists is relevant to this implementation. I begin with a photo of the ideal Holstein steer. This is a former student of mine whom I asked to take a picture of the ideal Holstein steer. He photographed this steer in Cannon Falls, Minnesota. He calls it a really ideal type of steer. Live weight just over 1,400 pounds, a dressing percentage estimate of 61.5%, yield grade three, high choice, a muscle score of one to two. The kind of steer that uh, in the right conditions, both a dairy steer harvester and a native cattle packer would be interested in having. It's a steer that has some fullness over uh, and, and smoothness over his ribs, a little bit of fat accumulation around the tail head, some levelness in his flank and, in his, and fullness in his brisket, and then has a relatively small head for his body. So he is a calf fed, high energy fed Holstein steer. In the upper Midwest, we have two uh, competing markets for Holstein steers. Uh, one is JBS and the other is American Foods Group. JBS prefers calf-fed steers up to 1,500 or possibly 1,600 pounds. American Foods Group prefers steers that are 1,400 pounds and heavier. So the sweet spot for marketing finished Holstein steers is in that range of 1,400 to 1,550. Of course, the steers need to be uh, appropriately finished and uh, outliers such as those that are incompletely castrated, which are stags, those that have been fed mainly silage diets, and those that have suffered from considerable stress prior to slaughter. Uh, those are all reasons for discounts to the Holstein steer value. The Holstein steer production system begins with the Holstein bull calf. And I wanna emphasize that we really prefer, well, we really recommend that Holstein bull calves receive, and dairy bull calves for that matter, receive colostrum that is uh, similar to the program that is applied to uh, replacement heifer calves. Uh, we do not have long-standing research on the effects of the absence of colostrum in bull calves on health or, or performance, um, but um, based upon what we know in dairy heifer development, uh, the implications of the absence of colostrum are severe. Um, I would recommend that those who purchase calves purchase uh, those calves with colostrum feeding as a stipulation. Castration is important. Incompletely castrated bull calves are called stags. As I mentioned, they suffer steep carcass discounts. Uh, count to two and then the job is done. Still in 2021, we need to make that point. Dehorn the calves to prevent bruising uh, of their pen mates. In terms of weaning and post weaning, the challenge is really calf respiratory health. And I believe that uh, respiratory health in these uh, young, uh, Holstein bull calves is due to a colostrum shortage, uh, may in part be due to the fact that they're receiving milk replacer and not milk, and also um, because they're in artificial environments, they simply don't have the same sort of air quality that a young beef calf has while uh, wandering next to, to its dam. The diet to these calves should be reasonably high energy, 60 megacals of NEG per 100 weight of dry matter and 18% crude protein. Holstein bull calves, or thereafter Holstein steer calves, do not really need a growing phase. They have sufficient growth potential that they can come out of a calf ranch and after a short transition, go on to the finishing diet. So this is a photo and a characterization of a Midwest feedlot operation in Minnesota where they took 300 pound Holstein steers, started them on a 56 megacal NEG diet, and then after a short time, incremented them to a 62 megacal NEG diet. Here's a second poll question. Uh, Mike, would you care to read this to the sure. audience? Um, very good, Dan. Uh, next one is, uh, 
Please indicate, indicate your familiarity with the following topics, EPD, uh, preconditioning, feed efficiency, yield grade, and any net energy G for gain. Again, similar uh, five choices there, all the way from very unfamiliar to unfamiliar, uh, working knowledge, familiar, and very familiar. Well, Abby, where do you fit in on these uh, new beef terms here now suddenly? Yeah, well, definitely have a more of a very dairy background, but have a little bit of experience with beef. So I would say I'm working knowledge for myself. We'll see what our audience members say on this topic. Again, I think we have a lot of dairy people, but people um, that are working more and more with beef genetics are probably getting more familiar with these terms. So we will see what people say. Okay, well, we got 76% in, so here are the results, uh, uh, Professor uh, Schaefer. Uh, very unfamiliar at 2%, very similar to with the dairy, unfamiliar 10%. Working knowledge, Abby, there you are, you're in the majority, 42%. Familiar, 23%, and a bit of drop, but very familiar uh, down from that third to about 22%. Uh, surprised, Dan? Uh, I, I'm actually encouraged by these results. I think the, 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 the majority have a consider themselves to have a working knowledge. I suspect they're growing. Their knowledge of these uh, beef terms and the beef uh, production system is growing and uh, I'm here to help them uh, down that path. So beginning uh, next with this net energy for gain term, which we apply to the characterization of feedlot diets and finishing diets, um, with uh, Jim's help, uh, I developed this slide. So this is a slide which characterizes the uh, net energy content of a finishing diet ranging from 0.65 down to 0.54. The diets uh, associated with these various NEG uh, concentrations are built with a 25% modified wet distiller's grain base, then 5% supplement for minerals and vitamins, salt, and then on top of that is a variable inclusion of corn silage, ranging from 10% to 50%. So the point I want to make here is that as the corn silage concentration in the diet increases, the net energy for gain value decreases because the offsetting ingredient is high moisture corn. So as high moisture corn in the diet increases, the net, en net energy for gain value increases. With regards to finishing uh, Holstein steers, the recommendation, my recommendation, really the industry's recommendation, is that these steers be fed a diet of at least 0.62 megacals of net energy for gain per pound of diet dry matter. So that means that the corn silage inclusion rate should not exceed 20% of the diet dry matter formula. The next point I wish to make is, uh, is that there is great consistency within the Holstein steer population. This consistency is due to the fact that the breed has an inbreeding coefficient of approximately 6 to 7 percent. The implications of this genetic homogeneity are both positive and negative with regards to Holstein beef production. The following closeout results display this consistency. I visited a farmer in uh, south, uh, in east central Iowa uh, a few years ago. He was feeding commercial uh, diets. Uh, to, through self feeders uh, into Holstein steers. These diets are based mainly on cracked corn with the inclusion of corn gluten feed if he wanted a little more fiber. Then both diets had distiller's greens and a balancer pellet. Neither of the diets included Thailand, Optiflex, molasses, probiotics, or other non-nutritional additives. There was no forage or roughage provided except for the fact that corn stalk bedding was provided in these pens. I want to point out that Holstein steers have a bad reputation in the central plains of, this, of the U.S. for uh, high incidence of liver abscesses. Thailand has been used for that control. Fortunately, here in the upper Midwest, we do not have this same liver abscess problem. So we have, there is really no need for inclusion of Thailand. The central plains folks will need to figure out what they need to do in order to get that problem under control for Holstein steers. However, so these are the diets fed in the closeout summaries, which I'm about to show you. I was able to uh, summarize 25 closeouts from this uh, East Central Iowa feeder. Um, the average group size in those 25 closeouts was approximately 350 head. 
the cattle started on feed at 480. They finished in this sweet spot, just over 1,400 pounds, 321 days on feed. Dry matter intake is approximately 21 pounds of dry matter intake per day, about a three pound average daily gain. And so the feed conversion efficiency is a value very close to seven. Those are three values that are easy to remember as benchmarks for high energy fed Holstein steers. Of course, Holstein steer carcass quality is very good. So 80 plus percent of those groups were choice and prime quality grades. I noticed uh, in particular, there were a set of five closeouts where uh, the Holstein steers had received the same cattle management regimen. In those five closeouts, <clears throat> The steers averaged their on-feed uh, weight of from 540 pounds to 610 pounds. They gained from 830 to 900 pounds, finishing just over 1,400 pounds. Across all groups, they averaged 1,445. Now, here comes the consistency point. So the dry matter intakes of those five groups are right, right in around this mean of 21 pounds of dry matter intake. The average daily gain values range from 2.7 to about 2.9 for an average of 2.8, and the feed conversion efficiency average is 7.54. Now I want to introduce you to a statistical term which is called the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation is calculated by dividing the standard deviation by the mean for a particular variable. And I want to draw your attention to the dry matter intake variable. 0.4 divided by 21.1 is a coefficient of variation of 2%. When we do a laboratory assay, we want a laboratory assay to have a coefficient of variation of 5% or less. Here is an animal production system where the coefficient of variation is less than 5%. Running here at 2%, it's 3.7% for average daily gain, 4.6% for, for feed conversion efficiency, and 1.5% for choice and prime percentage. That indicates that a production system based upon these Holstein steers can be very predictable. Uh, however, I wanna point out that the percent of Holstein steers that are lost to death or culled for, uh, for various reasons runs around 3.6%, which is a fairly high number relative to natal, native cattle feedlot uh, production. So with regards to consistency, I want you to know that it exists with regards to these top four variables. The dead and culled steers are a greater percentage than one would expect from similar native steers, native here meaning non-dairy. Um, and this result is probably due to early calfwood management and the inbreeding that exists within Holstein steers. With regards now to carcass characteristics, I'll divide the discussion of carcass characteristics into yield characteristics and quality characteristics. With regards to the yield characteristics, Holstein steers have a lower dressing percentage than native carcasses due to increased proportion of gut, reduced muscling score, less subcutaneous fat, increased liver size, increased proportion of abdominal fat. However, the hide of Holstein steers as a proportion of body weight is less and that that is an offset to this decline in dressing percentage. And there is a lower muscle to bone ratio associated with Holstein steers, really dairy steers for that matter. With regards to quality, Holstein steers have had higher marbling scores than, U than the US native fed cattle population. In recent years, there's been an improvement in the proportion of native cattle that grade choice and prime and so the difference the advantage held by Holstein steers is not as large now as it used to be. With regards specifically to eating quality, there are no breed differences in taste panel or tenderness attributes when one compares Holstein versus Angus. I did a review of that literature in 2007 and it's just, it's, it's, it's a strong testament to uh, the quality of, of the eating experience of Holstein beef. To summarize now, the Holstein steer should have no horns, pro be provided shelter, especially in winter conditions, uh, bedding uh, when the conditions are otherwise damp, 
a clean coat is uh, an important uh, characteristic to look for so that the animal is dem has had access to sufficient dry space, sufficient space to move around, no evidence of riding activity, and if the flooring surface is good, there should be no evidence of joint swelling. The finished Holstein steer should be around 1,400 pounds. The dressing percentage can vary from 58.5 to 61.5. Uh, less than three-tenths of an inch of back fat thickness. They're genetically trimmed from fat, as one of my friends used to say. About 12 square inch ribeye, 3% kidney, pelvic, and heart fat, a yield grade of three. With regards to their uh, quality grade, also, uh, they are a maturity, especially if they're calf-fed uh, finished steers. They will have um, nice marbling scores, uh, average choice in this case, for this steer for an average choice quality grade. JBS offers a contract for Holstein steers. Uh, the contract is for 47,000 pounds, which implies 35 steers. They, uh, it is a basis contract initially. They're $8 below the board um, for a basis, expecting a dressing percentage of 61 and a half. They stipulate a high energy diet greater than 350 days, beginning at 250 to 350 pounds uh, for calves fed a 64 megacal NEG diet, which implies less than 10% roughage in the diet. PAR is uh, choice quality grade, USDA yield grades of one to three, seven to 100 to 1,000 pound carcass, and a muscle score, which is a depth measurement of one to two. Uh, the one to two is an arbitrary score, but the depth measurement is taken at this point, uh, three quarters of the length of the ribeye. Uh, they'll do a depth measurement. The uh, native cattle typically have a thicker ribeye at that point than do Holstein steers. If the Holstein steer measurement at that dimension is too thin, there can be a discount uh, in this contract for that muscle score measurement. And here is a third poll question. Mike, would you care to pose this? Yes. Okay, get ready to vote here. To what extent have you had contact with beef on dairy progeny, uh, which means your, your crossbreeding program? And again, we have that same uh, grid there, uh, uh, very unfamiliar, uh, unfamiliar, the third choice, working knowledge, the fourth choice, familiar, and number five, very familiar. Uh, Abby, uh, are you going to uh, risk your, your voting record here? And which one are you voting for? <laughs> well, I think, you know, beef on dairy certainly is a buzzword in the dairy industry and more and more of the farms that we visit with are doing some beef on dairy or really jumping in and having a, you know, a certain percentage of the herd bred to beef. Um, I think, you know, there are fewer farms that are raising the calves themselves, but I'll be interested to see whatever in the audience here, if we have some people that are working directly with the, that breeding program and the calves. Well, we are at 70 plus percent, so uh, let's go ahead and share this uh, to our uh, people online. And Dan, you can comment, very unfamiliar. Ah, now we're gaining 8%, a little more uh, strength there. Unfamiliar, 14% up there a little bit. Working knowledge, 35% familiar, 34%. And then very familiar, a very small number, about 10% of the, of the attendees on today's webinar. Dan, what's your, your uh, take on uh, this result? Well, I think that the familiarity uh, answer had 34% is uh, speaks to the penetration of this concept in the dairy production, dairy herd management um, realm. Um, it's it's a it's a popular topic, and so I'm 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 very encouraged, uh, enthused over that sort of uh, degree of familiarity. Well, sex semen changed the landscape. As a result of the uh, emergence of commercially available sex semen in sufficient quantity, uh, it has resulted in the fact that there are now surplus dairy heifers. Whereas years ago, we can remember Holstein heifers selling for $700 a calf, uh, now uh, the selling price is uh, maybe up to $100. Uh, the technology of sex semen enables more rapid genetic progress in terms of genetic improvement of the dairy herd. But the question is what to do with the surplus cow matings. The goal, of course, would be to add value to the surplus calves. One way to do that is to find uh, a better means of getting value from um, Jersey cow progeny. So the Jersey bull calf has uh, not commanded 
uh, great prices in the past, and so is there an alternative to the Jersey bull calf? Secondly, substantial financial advantage to the Holstein mating could occur if one could have a quality, uh, an F1, a first generation crossbred that would qualify for the certified Angus beef premium. Well, I've mentioned the certified Angus beef program. Uh, here I'm drawing out some key elements of that as it applies to this concept of beef on dairy. Of course, the program begins with a qualification that the animal be at least half solid black hair coat. Well, one can accomplish that uh, quite easily uh, with, with, with by choosing bulls from several breeds, but thereafter come some additional program standards. The Certified Angus Beef Program requires that the qualifying uh, marbling level be modest, which is average choice or higher, and that there be, in the words of the CAB program, superior muscling. This was uh, always intended as being a criterion that would sort the dairy phenotype from the beef uh, native uh, phenotype. So muscling is uh, one of the challenges that uh, faces the F1 in its qualifying for the CAB program. Well, the, the advent of sex semen um, is, it may be, in my estimation, it may be having an effect on the valuation of Holstein bull calves. So I was able to obtain some statewide data for the state of Wisconsin for 85 to 110 pound Holstein bull calves for the calendar year 2021. And it appears that there may be some supply reduction occurring in the Holstein bull calf supply in this prime weight range of the uh, several day old Holstein bull calf, which has, result, has resulted in an increase in calf valuation from $80 per hundredweight um, to now up to 160 or more dollars per hundredweight. In recent times, recent weeks with the advent uh, of this high priced corn, there's been some pullback in these calf prices. But uh, nevertheless, it may be that these Holstein bull calves will command a slightly higher price uh, because of the shortage in supply and the availability of a market for those cattle as finished cattle. Here is a summary from April 22nd of 2021, a few weeks ago, from two locations here in the state of Wisconsin, Bonduel and Reedsville. Holstein bull calves at the Bonduel market were selling for $6,280 to $180 per hundred pounds for an average of 120. Quality beef calves, similar age from in Bonduel, were selling for 150 to 240 for an average of $195. That's a premium for the bull calf of $75 per head or per hundred weight, approximately per head also. Uh, so that's, that's the advantage of being able to produce this quality beef calf. With, but of course, they're going to, because we're not using sex semen necessarily for the beef sire that's used in beef on dairy matings, there are also going to be some female calves that result. And so what's the valuation for the quality beef heifer over the Holstein heifer? Uh, here, Holstein heifers were reported up to $60 on this particular date. Recently, I saw them up to $100. Um, I'm not sure what the premium is for the for the beef heifer resulting from the beef on dairy mating. Interestingly, um, uh, Bonduel reports crossbred feeder cattle are selling lower than true beef cattle, and they had an exclamation point at the end of that. The situation is that when beef on dairy matings occur, um, it is challenging to get added value from the sale of those F1 progeny when they are marketed as feeder cattle. So therefore, I'm going to be recommending that these beef on dairy progeny are sold either as young calves or that ownership is retained until, so they're, until they're sold as finished cattle. Here's some information from NAAB, National Association of Animal Breeders. In 2019, the domestic semen sales for the Holstein breed were up to nearly 16 million units. Uh, and for Jersey, those uh, semen sales were approximately 3 million units. In 2020, shown in the blue bars here, there'd been a decline of 6% in Holstein uh, semen sales and a decline of 5% in the Jersey semen sales, but an increase in by 17% in Angus sales 
and an increase of 49% in Simmental semen sales. Simmental and Angus seem to be the two winning breeds uh, in this as the industry sorts through which breeds to be using uh, for beef on dairy matings. You'll note down here that Wagyu has this large increase, some increase here in Charlet, but those numbers are really very small. And even Simmental numbers are fairly small, but in Angus, uh, the Angus Association has definitely noticed. A couple of months ago, Dr. Bo Harstein, Director of Research from Select Sires, uh, gave a seminar. Uh, and he indicated, these are, uh, he indicated in his presentation that <clears throat> Select Sires has noticed that the number of conventional straws sold as Holstein semen um, plateaued somewhere around 15 million straws processed. But the point he wished to emphasize is that whereas the beef straws typically had been, uh, they'd been processing about a million beef straws, now they were processing over 4.4 million straws of beef sire semen. So there's been there's definitely been a growth in that market. Select Sires, again, based on annual sales, indicated that from 2016, when uh, beef semen accounted for 6.8% of their sales, it had grown to 16.2% in 2020. Sexed uh, dairy semen had grown from 11 to 19, and conventional dairy semen had declined from 82 to 65%. Harstein indicated that the company believes that by 2025, the proportions of each of these three categories will be one third. Substantial growth, therefore, in the beef and in the sex sorted semen. Well, where do the challenges lie in the beef on dairy concept? And I have uh, six bullet points here that I've drawn from my, my knowledge of this uh, situation. Uh, they are uh, bull selection, the challenge of producing or providing, marketing large uniform sets of crossbred progeny, what to do with the crossbred heifer calves, colostrum feeding to the crossbred bull and heifer calves. If colostrum feeding is an issue now with the Holstein bull calves, what will it be with the crossbred bull calves? Another challenge is to maximize calf value through coordination among the dairy herd, the calf ranch, the feedlot, and the packing plant. And lastly, the packing plants are uh, really in need of doing cutting tests, whereby they can determine the beef cut yield from carcasses that are F1 progeny. First of all, bull selection. This is a paper published in the Journal of Dairy Science from a group at the University of Georgia where they looked at the conception rate of beef service sires bred to um, dairy cows, Holstein cows or Holstein heifers. In my data set here, I've just focused on uh, matings involving a Holstein cow. Um, they used as their um, key variable sire conception rate, which is a measure of bull fertility. Uh, this is something that has been measured over longer, uh, over many years, I believe, in the Holstein breed, but has not been typically measured for beef bulls because the use of AI by a single bull has really been relatively minor compared to the use of Holstein sires and Jersey sires for that matter. So when a Holstein bull is mated to a Holstein cow, they had a data set of uh, 14 million inseminations, 15,000 bulls, and the sire conception rate was 34%. When an Angus bull was mated to a Holstein cow, they had 233 inseminations, 1,300 bulls, and the sire conception rate was nearly the same, 33.8%. In fact, this difference was statistically different because of the power of this data set, but the authors concluded that there was very similar sire conception rate for Angus and Holstein bulls on Holstein cows. And they surmised that the Angus semen may have been more likely used on problem breeders and that could have recounted, accounted for some reduction in this sire conception rate. Nevertheless, the fertility of the Angus bull for which they had the greatest number of data points was similar to the fertility of a Holstein bull when bred to a Holstein cow. Then uh, Dr. Harstein looked at the um, uh, effect of breed, Holstein versus Angus, on semen quantity as well as semen quality in 2020. So with regards to sperm production, 
the Angus bulls per ejaculate were producing about the same number of sperm as were the Holstein bulls. And per collection, where a collection is a combination of two ejaculates, the numbers of sperm produced were 10.4 billion versus 10.7 billion. So he concluded that Angus bulls produce sperm as well as Holstein bulls. However, in terms of semen quality, there was a notable difference uh, recognized uh, by him and by select sires. With regards to motility, the motility of um, the Angus sperm was 10% less than was observed for the Holstein sperm. With regards to membrane integrity of the sperm and with regards to the morphology of the sperm, there were no important differences due to breed. But with regard to motility, it was notable. So he concluded, well, it makes sense. Angus bulls have not been selected for semen quality with the same sort of intensity that has been applied to Holstein bulls. And he showed this additional slide, which I found to be interesting. It, it speaks to the efficiency <coughs> with which um, sperm production by bulls ends up in um, straws available for sale. So this is the straws generated per collection and this is the straws that were moved into inventory per collection. So in the, Holste in the case of the Holstein, there were approximately a little over 600 straws produced per collection and the number of straws going into inventory was only 8% lower than the straws that were prepared for, uh, from the collection. However, with regards to beef, the discard rate between the straws per collection and the straws that passed the quality standards and went into inventory resulted in a discard rate of greater than 20% for uh, the beef sires in the select sires bull battery. So uh, with regards to the future selection of beef sires, AI studs will be selecting bulls from contemporary groups that have the genetic merit, which is complementary to the Holstein breed, plus bulls that have better semen quality characteristics. I think this means that when they select bulls for beef on dairy, they will not be going out to purchase high selling individual bulls from individual breeders because that simply doesn't fit the necessary criteria involved for genetic improvement of beef on dairy sires. So I believe they're going to be producing their own bulls and selecting from within their own contemporary groups. All right, what are the goals for half-blood dairy steers? The goal, I would say, the principal goal is to produce a consistent product, a consistent F1 generation. So here are two steers, a uh, Holstein Angus and a Jersey Angus. I, I have this photo simply to show the difference in frame size of these two cattle. Obviously, in the same group, this would be characterized as inconsistent F1 progeny. In terms of beef sire selection for dairy matings, I would say that uh, the aim is to produce an F1 that is more than simply a black calf. If it won't qualify for certified Angus beef, it's just a black Holstein or a black Jersey. There is no reason to value it greater than, Holst than a straight bred Holstein or Jersey bull calf. So therefore, this, there is this amazing challenge, which is to produce in the F1 generation progeny that meet the CAB standards. That's, that's a huge challenge in one generation. The traits of importance with regards to compliance um, and, and meeting that goal are marbling, muscling, and I want to make a com uh, comment here on respiratory health. So marbling is uh, a trait that has high heritability. Therefore, there will be no hybrid vigor or heterotic response. Muscling or muscle to bone ratio is medium to high heritability. There won't be a hybrid vigor response. However, respiratory health has a heritability of 0.07 to 0.22, not very highly heritable. So we could expect that in the F1 generation, there could be a, a, a favorable response in terms of respiratory health due to the benefit of crossbreeding. Here are uh, uh, my criteria uh, for beef sire selection for Holstein matings. I would say that the beef sire needs to be homozygous black, homozygous polled, 
have a frame so score which would moderate the frame score of the progeny compared to the Holstein, so a, a frame score of 5 to 5.5 .5 on a scale of 1 to 9. It would The sire should have a ribeye area EPD in the top 20, EPD standing for expected progeny difference, in the top 20% of its breed. We have no EPD for muscle to bone ratio or ribeye depth. Those are two important characteristics of muscling, but we have no genetic indicator of those. We just have this proxy ribeye area, so we probably should just select on the basis of ribeye area until there are better indicators of muscling that become available. Select for marbling in the top 20% of the breed. Both Jersey and Holstein have a great marbling characteristic. We just want to select a beef sire that does not diminish the genuine value that those two breeds already have with regards to marbling. Calving ease direct in the top 50% of the breed. So in response to this situation, the Simmental Association teamed up with the Holstein Association to make a whole sim, create a whole sim index by which they are choosing Simmental Angus sires, bulls, and for recommended recommended matings on Holstein cows. The Angus Association has generated a value index called dollars H, which is uh, the application of their selection principles on Angus sires that are suitable for Angus on Holstein. With regards to sire selection for Jersey matings, again, I would say that a, a homozygous black hair coat, homozygous polled, now the frame score should be a bit larger to add some frame score to the F1 progeny, six to six and a half. Ribeye area again in the top 20% of the breed, marbling in the top 20%, calving ease top 50%. The Angus Association has generated a dollars J index whereby they apply the Angus uh, selection criteria, Angus Association selection criteria to identify those bulls suitable for Angus on Jersey. With regards to the Jersey cow, I have a, and uh, its use in beef on uh, dairy matings, I have a friend who uses Gelby bulls on a Jersey herd, retains ownership of those calves all the way to the rail, all the way to the carcass, and captures a nice uh, premium for those uh, cattle. But for anyone who's selling F1 progeny from a Jersey cow mating, I would say that another viable option is to transfer Angus by Angus embryos into the surplus Jersey cows. So Simplot in Idaho has a Sim vitro embryo system whereby they collect ovaries from cull Angus cows, um, mature those ovaries, uh, mature those oocytes, then fertilize them and cultivate the embryo until day seven and then on day seven, transfer that embryo into a day seven, a cycle day seven recipient Jersey cow. Uh, that would ensure that the progeny from the Jersey cows receive a premium. Select sires, uh, not to promote them individually, but to merely indicate that this is a commercial venture for supply chain development. Uh, select Sires is attempting to work with partners whereby they can set up a coordinated relationship between calf ranches, feedlots, and packers for their dairy customers that are using beef on dairy. Uh, supply chain development is the challenge when one gets into the retained ownership concept. All right, with regards to performance of these F1 progeny, from birth to 400 pounds, we do not expect there to be any substantial difference between Holstein and Holstein crossbred progeny uh, in that time span of their life. From 400 pounds to 1400 pounds, we expect the crossbreds to have a slightly better average daily gain and a slightly improved feed conversion efficiency due to the heritability of those traits and the fact that the F1 progeny now will be intermediate between Holstein on the low side and some native breed on the higher side. With regards to a finishing program, we expect the Holsteins, uh, I would say Holsteins need to be started on feed, finishing diet at least by 750 pounds, so they finish by 1450. The half Holsteins could be started a bit later, they will finish a little lighter, and the natives can be started a little later even than that, 950 pounds to finish by 13 or something over 1300 pounds. Uh, all of these estimates uh, assume the use of an anabolic implant program, Holsteins, Revelor X, 
S for 200 days or Revlor S for the last 100 days in Holstein crossbreds or in natives. For your benefit in viewing perhaps the recording of this webinar, I show you nutritional recommendations for the growing and finishing diet, in this case the finishing diet for Holstein steers or the crossbreds. Uh, these are drawn from the 2016 uh, nutrient requirements for beef cattle uh, document. I've also shown here a trace mineral premix, uh, again based on the 2016 nutrient requirements for beef cattle document. And if one mixes this premix as I have uh, developed it here and includes it at 0.05% uh, of the diet dry matter, you will meet uh, the trace mineral requirements of these cattle. Uh, with this premix. The early results for the beef on dairy are encouraging. Here are some slides of black coated half dairy crossbred heifers harvested in January 2020 that weighed 1250, dressed 61 percent with 18 percent prime and 77 percent choice. Again, I just point out the variation that existed within this group of heifers. Here's a smaller frame heifer standing behind this larger frame heifer. JBS offers a contract for Holstein Cross cattle. <clears throat> it's the same contract they use for their high energy fed Holstein. So I will not repeat all the language that's shown here. It's the same as I showed you earlier. Interestingly enough though, there is a, a, a premium offered in that contract for carcasses that grade prime and a discount for those that grade select. No surprises there, but there is no premium offered for cattle that distinguishes high choice and average choice from low choice. If this were in that contract, then they would have a CAB program, but they do not. And so they're not, in, they're not asking and expecting the Holstein crossbreds to qualify for CAB. So there is no benefit for, for F1s that have average or high choice marbling in the JBS contract. The contract fits black Holsteins, which lack native type confirmation. These are the ones that are avoided by the native cattle packing plants. A steer like this mixed in with other Angus uh, based steers is going to stand out as an outlier. And that's the kind of animal that they want to sort away from. In summary, Holstein steers have deficiencies. They are in respiratory health, growth rate, feed conversion efficiency, and dressing percentage. But the market understands these deficiencies and knows how to value them. Despite these deficiencies, the growth, carcass yield, and quality of the Holstein beef is consistent. The supply of these cattle numbers hundreds in the hundreds of thousands, but it's declining. This is a mature market. This is in contrast to the Holstein by beef bull calf market, which is really um, an immature market. Uh, the easiest profit for one who's doing uh, beef on dairy is probably realized by selling the 100 pound calf. This market will become more discriminating as the finishers and packers gain experience with these bull calves and as cutting tests occur. So I'd say sell the F1s as calves or finished cattle, not as feeder cattle. My interpretation of the situation is that the market for Holstein bull calves will persist as long as there are packers with a market for Holstein beef. And they do have that market for the foreseeable future. When the supply of Holstein bull calves shrinks relative to the market demand, the market may incentivize more Holstein beef production. With regards to the finished F1s, uh, these beef type, those uh, F1s with beef type phenotype will be purchased by the native cattle packers with a CAB program. The dairy type phenotype will be purchased by the Holstein packers. And that concludes my presentation. Um, um, Abby or Mike, I will turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Schaefer. And we really appreciate your advice and recommendations here focusing on both Holstein steers and on the dairy beef cross cattle from your um, more animal sciences beef background experience. So thank you for sharing your insight with us. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Neogen for sponsoring this program. We really appreciate their support and help in providing this educational opportunity for all who are online today. I would like to invite you to our upcoming webinars. Um, we do our webinars the second Monday of the month, each and every month. And in June, we'll have a focus on consumers. And um, Nina von Kieserlink from the University of British Columbia will be joining us. And her presentation will be titled, Reimagining the Future of Dairy, Maintaining Our Social Lic License by Improving Animal Welfare. So 
she'll be focusing on some of the work that they've done up there in Canada on what consumers are thinking about what we do with our livestock on farms. And then in July, we'll focus on lameness and hoof health with a presentation by Carl Berge from the Dairyland Hoof Care um, Institute. So if you would, please mark your calendar and make plans to attend one of these future webinars. Um, as always, all of our webinars are posted online in our archives, and today's presentation will be available later this week. So if you would like to review it again or share it with somebody else, you can find that at our website, cords.com slash webinars. So please check us out there if you have any, um, any interest in this presentation or past ones. Mike, we did have a few questions that came in prior to the webinar. And then I want to remind everyone that if you have any questions now for Dr. Shaver, you can put them into the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll answer them at this time. But first, we have a few that came in last week. So Mike, if you would, please um, address those questions at this time. Well, certainly, Abby, we always welcome those questions that come in ahead of time, and Patty does a nice job passing them on to us. Our first one comes from the United Kingdom, and it says, do the studies of crossbred genetics containing information on the beef, uh, beef, uh, beefing or beef potential of a Jersey Holstein steer, or is it limited pretty much to the Holstein uh, cross with, with beef breeds? Dan, does that make sense to you? Yep, it does. Uh I would say my answer is that yes, uh, typically uh, here in the US, we're speaking of Holsteins crossed with beef breeds. Um, the market could be different in the United Kingdom. And so I really can't say that it needs to be restricted as we are restricting it here in the US. I would say that the growth potential of the Jersey diminishes, is diminished, is, is, uh, is slower than the growth rate of the Holstein. And so the Jersey Holstein cross would not do anything for the growth of the F1 nor the muscling in the F1. And those would be reasons why it would not be popular here. Okay, let's go to our next question. And uh, Dan, if you wanna push the next question Hi. forward, uh, we can uh, see it comes from Canada. And uh, his question uh, is uh, from Joe, uh, what do packers think of carcass quality in Holsteins and crossbred steers? I think you shared some of that data, but maybe a quick summary. I do. Uh, uh, they would, they uh, would not have any issues with regards to carcass quality. Their question would be with regards to carcass yield. And so here they're concerned about the proportions of weight, the, the weight distribution within the carcass between the high value cuts of the carcass and the lower value cuts of the carcass. And so this is where the packers are wanting to do cutting yield tests so that they can better assign a value to the crossbreds. Of course, the crossbreds can be variable. They can be Holstein Angus, they can be Holstein Simmental, they, they could be any number of combinations. And so, um, hitting that target and defining the applicable uh, yield value is a bit of a challenge. Okay, and I believe this is our, our last one here, and it's a bit lengthy at this point. <clears throat> we just finished calving, uh, and this is another from the United Kingdom, uh, Viking red heifers uh, that were bred to a stabilizer bull, whatever that is. Oh, it's listed there, it's a cross between Semental, Red Angus, Hereford, and Gelvey. Uh, There's good demand from the uh, for the calves from buyers, but they found that the calves to be inconsistent in size and stature, as well as color, lots of white hair, and some were uh, had unexpected horns. Do you have any thoughts on this cross and quality of calves for beef from the yeah. UK? Yes, yes. This is a this is a thought provoking question. So I had to look up Viking Red. Viking Red itself is a composite breed based upon three red breeds originating in um, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And so now those uh, composite heifers are being uh, were mated to a composite bull, the Stabilizer, which is a combination of those four breeds. Um, and now they found variation in the appearance. So I'm gonna go first to this horn, the appearance of horns. Um, neither the cow in this mating nor the bull in this mating uh, is, uh, is purebred, it's a, it's a combination. So if the allele from the bull is, uh, horned and the allele 
from the cow at that genetic locus is also horned, the progeny will be will have horns. Um, the progeny from the mating of these composites could only be expected to be pulled if they knew that one of the parents was homozygous polled. Polled is dominant to horned, and uh, if that's not, if one doesn't know that the that one of the parents is homozygous polled, then especially in a composite breed situation, horns could very well occur. The same logic applies to the presence and the appearance of uh, white hair um, uh, in the coat. Uh, this is uh, coming from one of the breeds, and if there is not homozygosity, uh, well, actually, I, I can't speak very knowledgeably about coat color genetics. Um, but uh, especially with, with reds. So um, anyway, this is, I, I think that the, the progeny can have, can be good beef animals. It depends upon the, what the market is expecting and if the market is expecting them to be pulled and, and completely red, um, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge working with uh, composite matings like this. Okay, now we're gonna go on, let's go to our next PowerPoint and uh... We will, uh, looks like we got about 10 questions in about five minutes. So uh, okay. Dan, if you wanna click ahead one PowerPoint and uh, to support yeah. our sponsor here today. And right. the first one's pretty straightforward. Uh, what do you mean when you mentioned on your one PowerPoint, significant financial advantage by avoiding Jersey bull calves, I assume. <laughs> oh, the Jersey bull calf market suffers around here in this part of the country. Um, Jersey bull calves are not worth as much as Holstein bull calves in the upper Midwest. And so um, I am referring to the fact that something other than a Jersey bull calf, some other progeny from the Jersey cow other than a bull calf would bring additional revenue to that enterprise. Okay, uh, two questions kind of similar, actually. Uh, the, and his comment is, uh, doesn't Holstein uh, bull calves price go up in spring, uh, not because of supply, but because people like to raise calves in spring and summer instead of the hard winter months at this point? And he says, we sell both Holstein bull calves and black crossbred calves, and they follow that same pattern of the good weather. Your comments on that? Uh I visited with the person who provided the data to me and uh, he too would said that there is a seasonality to this market. So it may be um, uh, unwarranted for me to assign the increase in calf price to a limited supply. Uh, I would uh, defer to the questioner who has experience in the market. If there is a distinct seasonality effect, I could believe it to be the case. Okay, would Jersey uh, times Holstein or cr a cross with Holstein's uh, females bred to beef reach the same beef quality criteria? In other words, uh, you Holstein and beef versus uh, a Jersey and beef. Uh, um, yes, uh, Holstein, okay, I heard the question differently. So Holstein, cro Holstein beef cross versus a Jersey beef cross, uh, in terms of quality, they will have the same eating experience. There is no difference. It is purely a muscle to bone ratio. Um, both the Jersey and the Holstein need some improvement in terms of muscle to bone ratio to improve dressing percentage and, and the yield of uh, well, you know, to improve dressing percentage. Um, but there is no difference. There's no discrimination against quality of either of those types of beef. Okay, uh, a little discussion in the background here. Sorry about that. Uh, one person says a size five, five frame seems small. Uh, sh does, should we put less emphasis on uh, I think it's body weight. He says CW, but I think it's BW. What, what comments about frame size five? Oh, I'd say frame size five. So the Holstein has tremendous growth potential, tremendous skeletal growth potential. Um, I mean, 1,500 pound Holstein cows are, are not unusual any longer, and 1,700 pounders are increasingly common. So a finished animal is likely, a finished steer is likely to finish at a weight which is equal to the mature weight of the cow herd. 
or the the weight the, the weight of mature cows in the herd so i think that moderation of holstein growth is um is very pertinent in order to keep the finished weights in the 1400 pound range using a, a larger frame bull whether it's uh, angus or uh, galvi uh, simmental uh, would be taking the f1 in in the direction of too much growth potential okay uh here's an interesting one implant from zoetis 200 day cinevax dash l a f or g could increase average daily gain compared to other implants your thoughts on that oh that's um that's uh the, the those are small differences uh due to the implant product um the comparison of the products really needs to be done on the basis of the progesterone and trenbolone acetate concentrations um or, or really estrogen and uh, trenbolone acetate concentrations in the implants um, on an on an equal estrogen plus TBA dosage basis there's there are not important differences between products um, I would also say that um, we, we we have to be um, Let's see, we, we have to be uh, somewhat moderate in uh, the choice of the aggressiveness of the implant program, uh, depending upon the market. But a moderately potent implant program is good in terms of growth stimulation as well as the retention of carcass quality. Well, here you go. Can you make money at $7 corn with beef? I think it will be very difficult. I think that if a dairy person is thinking about retaining ownership, they should not retain ownership. They should take the $75 per calf that they could get by selling it as a young animal and be happy with that. Okay, here's your last question. It's really my favorite question, really. Has there been any economic evaluation of the inherent discount at harvest for dairy type steers? Is it uh, is this diff is this discount justified or simply uh, leverage held by the packer against dairy type steers, including Holstein Angus crosses? All right, my colleague did this uh, evaluation many years ago. Uh, so in the late '80s, he did an evaluation and uh, found some merit for it. I have a I have a another current faculty colleague who hopes to do this economic evaluation under present circumstances. So the answer is no, there has not been a recent economic evaluation. Um, there is certainly some merit for the uh, discount of dairy steers relative to native steers, um, but I I can't say whether it is entirely justified but dressing percentages are are certainly different between the two categories of cattle um, i would say that uh, carcass quality grades are not different uh, so it really comes down to a yield difference between the two and then uh, still to this day, there are biases uh, that are harbored uh, relative to dairy steers. And that is a tough nut to crack in the marketplace. Okay, Daniel, I will turn the program back to Abby to wind up today. Thanks for all your great answers and uh, speedy responses. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. Once again, I would like to extend our gratitude to Dr. Dan Schaefer for his presentation and for answering this great group of questions that came in from our audience. Also, one more time, I would like to thank Neogen for their financial support of this program. I will point out once again that our upcoming webinars um, in June, we have a focus on consumer perceptions with a presentation by Nina von Kieserlink from the University of British Columbia. And then in July, we'll be focusing on lameness and hoof health with a presentation by Carl Berge. The June webinar is sponsored by the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council and July webinar will be sponsored by Hoof Sync. So thank you for that. And then last but not least, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate the time you spend with us and we hope this information will be put to good use on your farm or with the farmers you're, you work with. We look forward to hosting you again at a future webinar. Until then, please 
take care and I'll say goodbye from all of us here at Hordes Dairymen and our partners at the University of Illinois. Have a great day.